Well, good evening. Uh, this evening we're going to be looking at Psalm 46 for our Bible study. Psalm 46, so that's what I'm going to read now. This is God's Word. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The emphasis of Psalm 46 is that God provides strength and security for his people. We find this stated poetically at the beginning, middle and end of the psalm. In verse 1, God is described as our refuge and strength. Then in verse 7 and again in the final verse, God is described as our fortress and as the one who is with us. So the psalmist, which means the person who wrote the psalm, repeats this image of God being like a place that is both strong and safe. And the rest of the psalm shows us what that means and how we can be sure of that for ourselves. In verses 2 and 3, we read of cataclysmic events happening in the natural world, like earthquakes, avalanches and storms at sea. These are the kind of events that make us feel powerless because, in spite of all the technological advances we've made since this psalm was written, we are still unable to control the elements. We can't stop storms and we can't calm earthquakes. And that is one of the reasons why they make us afraid. In verse 6 we read of political upheavals. There are nations raging, and that could mean at other nations or internally through civil war. And there are kingdoms tottering, being unstable and about to fall. Here we find another cause of fear. Our sense of being powerless before greater political and governmental authorities. So the psalmist describes two things that make people feel afraid, natural disasters and political upheaval. But in those situations, God is with his people. He isn't just present, he is very present. While the Bible clearly teaches that God is everywhere, that there is no area of his creation where he is not present, we see that with his own people, he is very present and he is there to help, to act for their benefit. And while many other things have changed since this psalm was written, God hasn't changed. God is still very present with his people and at work for their benefit, guiding us as we try to follow the path that he wants us on and providing all we need to stay on that path. That's a great encouragement for us to pray this evening. We find a well-known promise about his commitment in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined 
to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God has a good plan for his people, to make us become more like Jesus Christ. And so whatever challenges we face, he will be at work in those situations to transform us. And one day, on the day of Christ's return from heaven, that transformation will be completed. So we read in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God is a very present help in trouble, the psalmist writes. Therefore, he continues, we will not fear. What should our response be to the committed and benevolent presence of God in our lives? We should not be afraid of the things that are more powerful than us because we have an even more powerful God at work in our lives for our good. This gives us a far more solid antidote to fear than wishful thinking. As an illustration, I suspect most of you have seen the film The Sound of Music. Do you remember the scene during the storm when the children all go to the bedroom of their nanny, Maria, because they're scared? What is, what is her answer to their fears? Rain drops on roses and whiskers on kittens. I simply remember my favourite things, and then I don't feel so bad. Well, I'm not going to argue with Julie Andrews, but I think, if we're honest, when we're afraid, we don't just want to not feel so bad. We want help, and we want peace. We want strength and security. Cream-coloured ponies and crisp apple strudels might distract us from our fears, but we want something or someone who can deliver us from our fears, and we find that in the Lord. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ and are adopted into God's family, we can be assured that a greater power is at work in our lives for our lasting benefit, and that assurance will help us to not be afraid. How does a river benefit a city and its citizens? By being a reliable resource for life, primarily because it provides an ongoing supply of water. This continually supports life, allowing the land to be fertile, green and fruitful for the people. Things grow and thrive on the banks of the river. So we have a picture in verse four of a community of God's people living in his city, living in fellowship with God, the Most High, and made glad by the streams that provide a reliable resource for life. It's always important to remember, whenever you read the Psalms, that you are reading them on the other side of the cross to the psalmists. They could see something of the gospel in the way God rescued his people from a variety of dangers. But we can see the fullness of the gospel in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the one who provides us with eternal life by dying for our sins on the cross and then by defeating death through his resurrection. Jesus is the reliable resource for life, one that never runs out. It shouldn't surprise us then that when Jesus meets a Samaritan woman by a well in the Gospel of John chapter 4, he refers to himself as that reliable resource of life-giving water. John chapter 4 verse 13 and 14, Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water, meaning the water from the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus is the one 
who is the reliable, never running dry resource for life. And when we find him, we therefore also find a never running dry resource for gladness and joy. We've already noted how the psalmist describes the Lord as a refuge and a fortress, images of strength and security. In verses 5 and 6, we are shown what that means for God's people. Whatever challenges there are, God is mightier, and his city, his people, shall not be moved. Putting it in modern terms, God will make sure that the Christian church worldwide continues to live, breathe and grow in spite of the upheavals and catastrophes that take place. God will help her in verse 5, because in verse 6 he utters his voice, the earth melts. We can trust the Lord to preserve the living presence of the church in the world, even as other kingdoms rise and fall, because he has greater power than all of them combined. When the Jews read those words in verse 5, God is in the midst of her. Their first thought was probably of the temple, the place where God lived among his people. But today, Christians don't think of a place, they think of a person, Jesus Christ. In Jesus, God came to live among us. We read in John chapter 1, verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we have seen his glory, Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the eternal living Word who became a person and made his home here on earth. John tells us that this Word was with God and was God. Hence the angel tells Mary, the mother of Jesus, that he shall be called the Emmanuel, meaning God with us. You might feel like saying that while Jesus lived on earth, God wasn't very present, he was very, very present. But we have to be careful because Jesus made a promise to his followers, namely that he would continue to be very, very present with his people. We'll look at this on Sunday when we consider the words Jesus speaks in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, where he says, And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Jesus would make it clear to his disciples that although he would be absent bodily, he would still be present by the Holy Spirit. So when the Apostle Paul writes to the Christians in Ephesus, he prays in Ephesians 3 verse 16 and 17, that according to the riches of the Father's glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The Spirit of God lives in every believer, making their heart a home for Christ. And Jesus makes this wonderful promise in John chapter 6, firstly verse 37. He says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Verse 40, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus doesn't rent accommodation. When he moves into a person's heart, it is for good. The psalmist tells us in verse 8 to come behold the works of the Lord. He calls us to consider the evidence of God's incredible power. We might think of the plagues he sent against the Egyptian oppressors, or the parting of the Red Sea, enabling the Israelites to escape captivity. We might think of the waves then crashing down on that pursuing Egyptian army, or of the giant Goliath crashing to the ground. Throughout Old Testament history, we see examples of the rescuing work of God, demonstrating 
his unsurpassed power and proving his commitment to his people over and over again. We are simply being called to recognise the evidence that confirms our confidence in the Lord is well placed. So what are we as Christians living this side of the cross to behold first and foremost? What's the most important work that God has done that demonstrates he can overcome the plans of the powerful? Well, we've been looking at that work over the last few weeks on Sunday mornings as the enemies of Christ conspired to thwart God's rescue plan. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul reminds his readers of the gospel and tells them that it is the most important thing for them to remember. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Here is the most important of God's works that we are to behold the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, bringing about the rescue of God's people from their sins, just as God had promised in the Old Testament scriptures. How does remembering the gospel help us to obey the Lord's instruction in verse 10? To be still and know that I am God? because it is through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that we receive the strength and security that is described in Psalm 46. The gospel, therefore, can give us a calmness and an assurance of God's benevolent presence that remain even as the nations rage and the waters roar. We see the strength of God demonstrated in the gospel as he overturns the intentions of God's en Christ's enemies. They thought the cross was the end of Christ's glory, when actually it was the means. Through the death of Christ, God cancels our debt of sin, nailing it to the cross. Thus we read in Colossians 3 verse 15, God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. In Christ, God breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He demonstrates his strength and gives us the security of knowing the debt is fully paid. Then in Christ's resurrection, he demonstrates his strength again, breaking down the barrier between this life and the next. Thus, when we trust in Jesus Christ, when by faith we unite ourselves to him in his death and resurrection, we experience the security of knowing that Christ has led the way to heaven for his people to follow. We read in Romans 6 verse 8. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. In verse 10, God makes a promise about the future. That he will be exalted around the world. There will be a day when every person who has ever lived will acknowledge the authority of God because his kingdom will outlast all others. Thus, when John has a vision of heaven, a vision of the city of God, we find it rich with images from Psalm 46, and therefore rich with fulfilled promises, particularly in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 to 4, and chapter 22, verse 3, 1 to 3. We read that the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. We read of the river of the water of life flowing through the city of God. And we read that the former things, the things that caused us sorrow and grief, have passed away for good. God's kingdom has outlasted every other. And in his eternal kingdom, there will be no catastrophes or upheavals, Instead, there will be eternal gladness 
for God's people as they worship the Lord. This is the future for all who drink the living water that Jesus Christ offers. For those who trust him as the one who died for their sins and who rose from the dead in victory. Psalm 46 reminds us that God is committed to his people and that he provides us with the strength and the security we need to endure as his people in a hostile environment. And when we believe the gospel, we are given a cornerstone upon which we can build our confidence in God's commitment, a foundation that enables us, even as nations rage and waters roar, to be still and know that he is God, and one day the whole world will acknowledge it.